In this video, we're going to focus on interpersonal relationships on the court. The Supreme Court is just a group of nine co-workers, and their personal relationships with each other can affect the work that they do. Now, in this video, we're going to be focusing mainly on the conflicts, some of the famous conflicts that have arisen, but I don't want to overstate things because the court is often quite collegial, and friendships can arise even across ideological lines. For example, we've talked about how Antonin Scalia could be very sarcastic and very cutting and very insulting in his opinions, and yet, people really liked him. He made friends easily on the court. Everybody called him Nino, and in fact, as your book The Oath points out, every holiday season, he and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who couldn't agree on just about anything regarding the law, they would get together with their families, their spouses, and have a holiday party each year in which their spouses would cook a big meal. Another touching example was when William Rehnquist's wife got terminal cancer, one of the individuals who he uh, looked to for support and who provided moral support was William Brennan, whose wife had also died of cancer. William Brennan and William Rehnquist were ideological opposites, but they found common cause in their common suffering. So there are friendships, uh, but in this video we're going to focus on some of the more famous conflicts that have occurred on the court and try to explain why. Why is it that they fight? One of the reasons they fight is simply that some of them have very big egos. One of the classic examples of this was Associate Justice Felix Frankfurter. Felix Frankfurter had been a professor at Harvard Law School and he had been so intimidating that in fact in the 1970s there was a TV show about a really, really mean Harvard Law professor. It was called The Paper Chase and it was modeled after Felix Frankfurter. You teach yourselves the law, but I train your minds. You come in here with a skull full of mush, and if you survive, leave thinking like a lawyer. Everybody that encountered him noted that Felix Frankfurter had an incredibly large ego. In fact, a psychologist wrote about Frankfurter, Frankfurter can only be understood politically if we understand him psychologically and we can understand him psychologically as representing a textbook case of neurotic personality. Someone whose self-image is overblown and yet, at the same time, essential to his sense of well-being. The key aspect of Frankfurter's personality was his attitude toward political opposition. Because his self-image was inflated and because his psychological peach rested upon that self-image, Frankfurter could not accept serious, sustained opposition in fields he considered his domain of expertise. He reacted to his opponents with vindictive hostility. Unconsciously, such hostility was a projection of his own self-doubt. A classic example of this was a letter that Frankfurter once wrote to fellow Justice Jackson, and in this letter he talked about some of the other members on the court, and let's take a look at this letter and see the way he described some of his colleagues Felix Frankfurter wrote, look at them. Hugo Black is a self-righteous, self-deluded fanatic, part demagogue, devoid of play and humor. Stanley Reed is largely a vegetable. He's managed to give himself a nimbus of reasonableness, but is as unjudicial minded, as flagrantly moved at times by irrelevant considerations for adjudication as any of them. He has a reasonable voice, in the service of a dogmatic, worldly, timid mind. Bill, that's William O. Douglas, is the most cynical, shamelessly immoral character I've ever known. With him, I have no more relation than the necessities of court work require. He's too unscrupulous for any avoidable engagement. One of the ways in which this ego would manifest itself is that when a new justice would join the court, typically Frankfurter would send them a note welcoming them and promising them his help and his support. When they first got to the court, he would visit them frequently, 
and if their first vote agreed with Frankfurter's vote, he'd lavish praise on the newcomer, so he'd make them feel very welcome. But as soon as the new justice took an opposing side, Frankfurter would rebuke them during conference and sometimes issue a memo declaring that the appointment had been a terrible mistake. For example, when William Brennan joined the court, Frankfurter quickly realized that Brennan wouldn't be taken in by such flattery or intimidation, and so Frankfurter decided that Brennan had an ego problem. He wrote to a friend, I've decided to curb my temperamental spontaneity and not talk to Bill Brennan. Too much ego in his cosmos. Quite ironic for Felix Frankfurter to be accusing somebody else of having too much ego. Another source of conflict between the justices is simply the perceived personality flaws or moral failings of the justices. One of the more interesting justices to ever serve on the court was William O. Douglas, who served in the 60s, and obviously morality was a bit different back then, but Douglas attracted controversy to the court, which they didn't like, because Douglas was married four different times, and three of those times he had been older than 60, while his bride was younger than 25. Here, for example, is a picture of Douglas with his last wife, Kathy. Douglas was 67 and she was 22 at the time they married. Uh, so this attracted a fair amount of attention to the court. And in fact, this is alluded to in the uh, Muhammad Ali's greatest fight that you are watching. Another thing that Douglas did that would irk the members of the court is that he would often travel and it wasn't the traveling that bothered him, but the fact that his traveling sometimes would interfere with the business of the court. At one point, for example, uh, he left Washington, D.C. to take a tour of the Middle East, uh, including Beirut and Karachi, and he simply said that even though he wouldn't be able to be present or to be contacted, he just didn't think it was gonna be a problem. But my favorite William O. Douglas story of all time occurred in August 1970 when the court wasn't in session. The American Civil Liberties Union was seeking an emergency injunction and since the court wasn't in session, the procedure was for them to go to William O. Douglas. Well, William O. Douglas was staying in a cabin and two lawyers went to the cabin where he was staying only to find that he'd gone on a 10-day backpacking trip into the mountains. The lawyers had to contact U.S. forest rangers who used a helicopter to locate Douglas's camp. The attorneys then, dressed in their business suits, had to hike six miles into the mountains from the closest road. When they found Douglas, he sat there and he listened to their argument. So out in the woods, these two attorneys presented their legal argument and he told them that they had to return the next day at noon for his decision. He said he would, quote, leave the decision on that tree stump over there. The next day, one of the attorneys had to walk back uh, the six miles into the mountains and they arrived at the camp. The camp was abandoned, but underneath the rock, written on a small piece of paper, was a decision denying their petition. So even though they had done all of that, William O. Douglas ruled against them anyway. The other justices on the court weren't too personally bothered by William by Douglas's behavior, but they were bothered by the fact that it attracted criticism to the court. But big egos, womanizing, and a love of travel are of course not the only flaws that justice have had. Just like any group of human beings, some of them are simply prejudiced. The classic example of this was Justice James McReynolds, who served on the court about 100 years ago. He was a rabid anti-Semite. He absolutely hated Jews. And at the time that he served, uh, one of his fellow justices was Jewish Justice Louis Brandeis. Every year, the court has an annual photo that they hold, and Justice McReynolds refused to participate in the annual photo if Justice Brandeis was there. In addition, uh, one year the Chief Justice organized a ceremonial train ride for all of the justices to take, 
And once again, McReynolds refused to participate because Brandeis was going to be involved. The justices also occasionally fight over the court's procedures. For example, every year beginning in 1951, Felix Frankfurter would send his colleagues a memo outlining procedural changes that he thought were necessary. Most of these changes involved allowing the court to have more time for writing and thinking. His changes weren't adopted in 1951, but then in 1952 he issued a new version of the memo and this became an annual tradition. Every year he would issue a new memo. When he started in 1951 his memo was four pages long. By 1960 it was ten pages long and people started to get angry. William O. Douglas finally wrote a letter to Frankfurter and he said, We are not first grade law students who need to be put under strict restraints. In the great bulk of cases, our minds are fixed at the end of oral argument. One who's not prepared on a case passes and does not cast a vote. His vote is cast when he is ready. The blowing of whistles, the counting to three or ten, the suspension of all activity for a stated period of time may be desirable and necessary on playgrounds or in sports. But we are not children. We deal not with trivia. We are not engaged in contests. Schoolroom procedures are not fit for our tasks. Another classic example, and this is one that's alluded to in the Muhammad Ali's Greatest Fight movie that you're watching, was the tendency of Warren Berger to manipulate the process of opinion assignment. Of course, as you know, when the Chief Justice is in the majority, they get to make the opinion assignment, but they don't get to make the opinion assignment when they're in the dissent. Well, Occasionally, Chief Justice Berger would cast a vote that he didn't really believe. He would then assign the opinion and then later he would change his vote. So some justices felt this was a subversion of the court's rules. And once again, it was William O. Douglas uh, that made his anger known in a letter to the chief. Historically, the Chief Justice has made the assignment if he's in the majority. Historically, the senior in the majority assigns the opinion if the Chief Justice is in the minority. If the conference wants to authorize you to assign all opinions, that will be a new procedure. Though opposed to it, I will acquiesce. But unless we make a frank reversal in our policy, any group in the majority should and must make the assignment. It is not for us in the minority to try to outwit the majority by saying, I reserve my vote, and then recast it to control the assignments. That only leads to a frayed and bitter court full of needless strains and quarrels. Transitions on the court can also lead to conflicts. When one justice leaves the court and another one joins it, that can change the dynamics. For example, in the very early days of the Supreme Court, believe it or not, all of the justices actually used to live together in the same boarding house in Washington, D.C. They had their regular homes back in their states, but when they were in Washington, they lived in the same boarding house. But in the 1830s, when Justice John Marshall left the court, his political opponents saw this as the beginning of their chance to clean house and the other holdovers of the court saw that change was coming and so it was at that point that they decided to stop living together. A more notable example occurred uh, when President Harry Truman had an opportunity to appoint somebody to the Chief Justice position. Both Justice Jackson and Justice Black were hoping that they were going to be appointed to the Chief Justice position. Unfortunately, neither one of them got it but Justice Jackson thought that Justice Black had threatened Harry Truman and that he had said that he would resign from the court if he appointed Jackson as Chief Justice. The fact of the matter is that Black had never made any such threat, but Jackson thought that he had, and in fact their relationship was poisoned for the rest of their time on the court. But perhaps the most important transition of all occurred in 1925 when Justice Harlan Stone joined the Supreme Court. The interesting thing is before the 1920s, the Supreme Court actually didn't have that many non-unanimous decisions. Most of their decisions were unanimous. 
it was starting in the 1920s that the court started to fracture and have many more decisions with concurrences and dissents and various political scientists have indicated have argued that it was due to the arrival of Harlan Stone on the Supreme Court. Justice Stone later became Chief Justice, but he was intensely disliked, and several scholars believe that it was the abrasiveness of his personality that led to our current tradition of every justice writing their own opinion rather than the justices coming together to try to find common ground. And finally, of course, ideology is a source of division on the court. One would naturally expect that liberals and conservatives would fight with each other, but sometimes even people on the same side can fight with each other. For example, Lewis Powell and Thurgood Marshall often voted on the same side in civil rights cases in favor of the civil rights litigants. But often, Powell would adopt a more moderate approach. Powell was a rich white man, Thurgood Marshall had grown up as a poor African-American, and so they saw these issues very differently. And in one case, Justice William Brennan had asked Marshall to soften one of his opinions. Marshall simply refused. He said, I continue to believe that the majority's approach will, by its nature, be ineffective in ending racial discrimination in the use of peremptory challenges. I see no reason to be gentle in pointing that out and I doubt that pulling my punches would make the situation any better. In other words, why should I make my personal and professional disagreements unclear? And finally, of course, ideology is a source of division on the court. One would naturally expect that liberals and conservatives would